multiple flowers. It's not just one flower, lots of little um, florets. So the, the, the bees can just visit all the different flowers and really, really um, sort of feed well without using a lot of buzzing energy to get to another flower. And it's easy to land on as well. Um, and another very basic type of plant, and stick the plants, you know, all the carrot family and the umbellifers, but these are really important. Any plant like this, platform like this, really important for short-tongued bees and hoverflies. And by short-tongued, so, they, they, you know, bees come in different sizes and colours, their tongues vary in length as well. And they, they vary in, in, in Great Britain and Ireland from between about um, 0.5 of a millimetre through to 15 millimetres. So we have our bumblebee, Bombus hortorum, that's the garden bumblebee, has a tongue so long that when she's flying, and she's, she pollinates your beans, as she's flying between beans, you kind of know it's her because her tongue, she, she leaves her tongue out. So, so we need plants for short-tongued and long-tongued bees. This is for short-tongued. Um, anything in the aster family, and we've got Michaelmas daisies are still flowering at the moment, and look at them when you get home because they, they will be covered in hoverflies and short-tongued bees. Uh, just just as an aside, the, the honeybee's tongue is about 6.3 millimetres in length. So it's, it's categorised as a long tongue bee, but it's not really. It, it's got a short to medium length tongue, the honeybee. And, and there are, so you'll never see a honeybee in a foxglove, for instance. Uh, there are lots of plants that, that, are, um, that you need long tongued bumblebees to pollinate. Then you've got plants, cup shaped plants like this. And this, so the, the nectar right down there in the bottom. This is lungwort, pulmonaria. This is a hairy-footed flower bee. Um, this is a solitary bee that looks just like a bumblebee. If you see, if you have lungwort, dwarf comfrey, um, wallflowers, um, red dead nettle, uh, and it's early in the season, then you see a little black fuzzy bee um, buzzing around with its tongue sticking out, making a high-pitched noise, or a little ginger bee buzzing around, knocking bumblebees off its patch, then you have got hairy-footed flower bees. Um, and this is the female here, and this is the male. This, this is the male hairy-footed flower bee. And another type of flower, so primrose, really interesting. You look at the primrose. Uh, the, it's actually the, the pollen, the nectar rather, is deep inside it. Although it looks like a little cup, the nectar's deep inside, so this takes a long-tongued bee. You won't see honeybees on this. You won't see short-tongued bumblebees. Um, only the long tongue bees. And back to harebells again. So, so you've seen the tiny little harebell bees. Uh, and, and this, just for comparison, this is a bumblebee, a red tailed bumblebee foraging on a harebell. So these are bell shaped flowers. So you, you've got flats, you've got bowls, you've got tubes, you've got funnels, bells. And then you start to come to the slightly more complicated shaped, most complex shaped flowers. And this, this is sage. Um, and you see it has a lip on the bottom and what, what happens with this is when the bee, and this is um, the um, garden bumble bee with the longest tongue and she's got to get down there with her tongue um, and as she lands on the flower and as she lands on the lip there's a trigger mechanism. So this is where the plants are starting to get clever, a bit of plant intelligence here and the trigger whacks the pollen down onto the back of the bumblebee, so she will then take it into the, to, to the next flower, it'll rub up on the next flower. Um, then we've got foxgloves. Um, foxgloves, foxgloves, um, the pollen is if, right at the very, very top. They've just gone over now, but next year, if you, you look at the inside of a flower, it's got two, two sort of stamens with two blobs of white pollen, and the, it's only bumblebees you'll see on, on the foxgloves, and you'll know they've been on your foxgloves, because they come out with kind of dual carriageway of white on their, on their backs. And so this plant, um, pollen's up there. It's not going to want a tiny harebell bee to climb in and take the nectar. So it has developed a strategy to prevent that. And it's, it has around here sharp little spiky hairs that the smaller bees don't like. Um, so, that, so it is the large bumblebees that you will see in your foxgloves. Um, yeah, I'll have to sound of some buzzing when they go up. Oh, I know, it's fine. Oh, oh I, I'm going to put my volume on. I hope I've got a really good buzz sound in a minute for you, uh, if it works. But this is um, so... Um, uh, uh, cook, 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 camp, camp, campion, yeah. red campion. Red campion, tight shut, 
So this takes, this is going to be pollinated either by a butterfly, long times, or a, a bee with a very long tongue like the garden bumblebee. But um, it, it has this great nectar reward deep down inside that you can see here. So we have, um, out of our 24 bumblebees, two of our bumblebees, the buff tail bumblebee and the white tail bumblebee that are both big and they have quite powerful jaws. And they have learned to bypass the whole pollination thing. And what they do is they just nibble a hole straight into the nectaries. And this is called larceny. Um, so this is actually a crime. <laughs> um, or nectar robbing. Um, so, so, and once they've nibbled the hole, you'll see other bees and you'll see wasps and other creatures entering the hole. They haven't created the hole. You know, they're not primary robbers. They're just secondary larcenists. Um, just, they're looters, they're just taking advantage of the whole, um, and I've actually got... My bees do that with comfrey. They are oh, comfreys, yeah, comfrey is right, comfrey, aquilegia, yeah, comfrey, there are, there's only one or two bees that actually go into the comfrey legitimately, um, most of them just nibble holes straight into it, and this is actually, I, I, this is just a lucky shot, you can actually see her tongue going in, straight in there, this is Nottingham not even catch fly, I think. Um, and then just one more, I want to show you this. This, this is incredible. This is a tomato, tomato flower. Um, tomato flower, tight shut. They have anthers inside them that I think, I think I've got this right, are called peridical anthers. They, they don't give up their pollen easily or willingly. Honeybees haven't got a clue what to do about this. Most solitary bees haven't got a clue. Bumblebees, on the other hand, um, know exactly how to get the pollen and this is not my photograph this is a, a North American bumblebee so the bumblebee flies along and she wraps herself around the flower the tomato flower then she disconnects the flight muscles inside her thorax she starts to vibrate and she vibrates and vibrates and vibrates until she reaches about 400 Hertz and when she does that the flower opens and explodes its pollen out all over wow. The bee. So this is how your pollinate your, your your tomatoes get pollinated. Um, it's called when the pollination is taking place. This is buzz pollination or sonication. Okay. So that that's and that's what. So you know, it's now starting to get a picture. Of these different bees, all important in their own right for different reasons when it comes to pollination. And then this next one, and I haven't got speakers or anything, but you'll at least be able to watch. So if you've got poppies in your garden, um, and so usually you get bees, you know, you're listening, you're lying in your garden, or sitting in your garden, listening to the bees, and they're all very sort of very, very deep. And then all of a sudden, you hear a very, very high-pitched and it's, it's a bit like a dentist drill, and I'm going to show you. It's a bee having a pollen bath. I hope yes. you did, yeah. Um, so, so that's that's buzz pollination, and that's just worth watching out for. And that that happens with lots of the cup-shaped flowers, but especially poppies. Um, globe artichokes is another one. Oh, do they do that on globe artichokes yeah. as well? Oh, I must watch out. We've got globe artichokes on the allotment. And Rosa Ragosa. And the Rosa. Yes, definitely the Rosa Ragosa. Definitely, definitely. There's actually a lot of plants. A surprising amount of plants require buzz pollination for pollination to release um, their, their pollen, quite unusually. So, there's so many more different relationships um, between flowering plants and bees, and I, that's just bees, you know, I'm just talking about bees, many, many relationships between flowering plants and other pollinators. But the next thing, in the case of a bee, because bees are, remember, out to collect pollen to take home, is they have to collect the pollen and then get it back to their nest or their colony. So, the, so we've got, bees are, social or solitary so all honeybees and bumblebees are social bees so by by social true sociality means that you know, they cooperate they they cohabit they communicate very often but crucially they have they have an overlap in generations so the the mother 
is um, alive at the same time as the young. And they have a caste system. Social bees have a caste system. So they have a queen, they have drones, and they have workers. There's a hierarchy. Solitary bees, you know, the majority of our, our bees are solitary to various degrees or another. You know, there are various degrees of sociality, but, but a true solitary bee is really like a single parent, um, a single mummy. She, she cares completely um, for, she lays her eggs um, into a little lump of pollen, so she provides for them. Um, she dies and they, they then um, develop on the pollen that she has left provided for them. Um, so that's the, that, that's the basic difference. Now, social bees, so all the honeybees and bumblebees, they all collect their pollen and pack it into pollen baskets. So this, is, this is a honeybee. Um, this, is, this is kind of image you see all the time. And a bumblebee the same. And a bumblebee can carry up to 50% of her body weight in pollen, which is extraordinary, at, at the same time as maybe another 40% of her body weight um, of nectar in a honey crop. Um, so, so quite remarkable. And you can see that's not going to drop off. So she's a great pollinator for the fuzzy and everything she catches sort of on her hair, not because of what she collects in her pollen baskets. And, and the reason I'm telling you this is because solitary bees do this in a different way. So solitary bees kind of divided between those that nest in the ground and those that nest in cavities. So you've got ground nesters, often called mining bees, and cavity nesters, cavity nesters or aerial nesting bees. And you can get a clue as to whether it is ground nesting or cavity nesting by the way it collects its pollen, by if you look at its pollen collecting apparatus. And so this is a ground nesting bee. And if you see, you see her legs, um, her legs are really, really covered in hairs. Um, so very unlike the wide, um, sort of smooth pollen basket of the social bees. And because of this, when she goes out, to collect her pollen, the ground nesting solitary bee, um, she, she, you see it's cakey. So it's, it covers her, her legs, sometimes the side, sides of her body as well. And you can see it's not packed. So it, it's going to drop off, which makes her a little bit messier, which makes her a better pollinator. So that's the ground nesting solitary bees. The cavity nesting solitary bees, and, and you'll have heard of red mason bees um, and leaf cutters. There are still some leaf cutters just about around at the moment. Um, and you may just have evidence with beautiful lacy patterns they make in your leaves, or you may be lucky enough to watch them flying past, carrying a rolled up piece of leaf underneath them into, I don't know, an old bamboo or a, um, some wind chimes or a bee hotel or something. But the way that they collect it is underneath I don't even need to use this little thing for this. It, it, she's covered this bee, absolutely caked mm. with soft um, pollen grains, which are clearly going to fall off very, very easily. So as she pollinates, and this, this is a leaf cutter, um, red masons look pretty much the same. So a red mason, um, red masons are on the wing, they're flying at the time that the apple orchards are blooming. One red mason is capable of doing as much work as a hundred honeybees in an orchard on one day because she's messy, just because she's messy. So, so, you see this, so you see now all of these bees, very important, they all have different roles and different ways of, of doing, of pollinating. And it's just to show them all together. So social bees, solitary bees. Um, then there's this other bee as well. I just want to show you, this is a yellow faced bee. Um, a Hylaeus bee, and this bee actually takes her pollen back in her honey crop, um, and she's not very hairy. So, so chances are she is she is probably not the world's greatest pollinating insect. Um, and this just brings me back to to the very beginning. We should still so so the powers that be probably wouldn't be fighting to save her, but we should anyway for her intrinsic value. It, you know, rather than be focusing all the time on whether something's good or bad for pollination. So we plant plants that will hopefully attract this bee um, to our garden as well. And one other bee I want to show you um, is another of my favourites. This is the yellow loosestrife bee. So this is the only bee um, that sticks her legs up in the air to say I'm not interested to the passing males. So that's what she's doing with her legs up in the air. Um, and she's collecting oils as well as pollen and nectar. 
She's collecting oils to help waterproof her underground nest, which is usually built around riverbanks or in the fens or in bogs or marshy areas. Um, so, so just a few of our bees visit the flowering plants, not just for nectar and pollen, but also for oils, and this is one of them. Um, and um, just the last sort of bee photograph to do with pollination, can you see that pollen doesn't just come in yellow and orange, um, comes in, again, all the colours of the rainbow. This, this is Phacelia, which is a fantastic plant, it's, it's like a green manure, but it's also, Phacelia is one of the best beneficial insect plants that you can stick on a patch on your allotment or wherever, and, um, and the, the pollen just happens to be the same colour as, as the flower. So, so much more there um, as well. But that, that, that's just a, a whistle-stop tour through, through sort of pollination and the relationships that bees and insects have with flowering plants. And what it's all about is biodiversity, you know, coming back to it, it's not a case of one bee fits all or one plant fits all. Uh, and it's, it's biodiversity that we are, um, you know, it's not just in danger of losing anymore, we are losing, you know, biodiversity, um, of the planet is in is in great trouble and i'm not going to go into bee decline um in any great detail but the important thing is to know that it is very complex and um it, it's not just pesticides or just um habitat loss the combination of many many different factors um including poor management and husbandry which doesn't just apply to honeybees that also applies to commercially reared bumblebees now and and solitary bees sadly um, pollution, electronic and chemical. Um, not much peer-reviewed scientific evidence out there about the electronic, uh, electronic pollution yet, but, but if you, just, you know, it's the 5G um, thing, we, we, we really don't know. We really are messing big time uh, with our systems. And there is plenty of um, um, evidence, scientific evidence, about the chemical problems. Sadly, um, that, again, the powers that be need unequivocal scientific proof um, uh, this whole unequivocal word is, is, is the worst word in that um, before they will make changes hence the whole neonicotinoid fight that we've been having the battle we've been having for the last few decades okay, so um, non-native species and diseases um, also a problem uh, for honeybees that would include um, things like varroa American fowl brood um, invasive species bringing in diseases that um, our bees cannot responding to the warmth flowers tend also to respond to daylight hours the lengthening in daylight hours so everything's out of sync so so that that's why climate change as well um, it, it's not just the obvious causes pesticides and habitat loss I want to so habitat loss this is what we've lost this this is a perennial wildflower meadow this is Martin Down uh, nature reserve just outside Salisbury and it's incredible but but we've lost 98% of of such habitats um, wildflower meadows and grasslands um, since the end of the um, First World War so so and this has been devastating for some of our um, our, our native um, bees that rely 100% on native wildflowers because their relationships have built up over centuries and centuries um, so we have got bees that are okay in the gardens they're the ones that are doing well but the ones that really relied, the long-tongued bumblebees that relied on these habitats, um, are like um, the great yellow bumblebee that I showed you earlier, are in big trouble. And of course, this is what it's being replaced with, with monocultures. And there aren't even any field margins here. And this is fine. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, this could be nutritious if it's grown without pesticides for the few weeks that it's flowering. But if the entire landscape is covered with this, then there's no chance, um, you know, the bees can't get to that stage in their life cycle 
if they haven't got foraging before May and June, and they can't complete their life cycle if they haven't got foraging after the oilseed rape finishes flowering. It's fine, honeybees can be moved to these locations, but not the solitary bees um, and the bumblebees. Haven't quite gone this far yet in oh, this country. This is the California almond orchards, and I've deliberately chosen a very stark um, photograph rather than one of, of them all in bloom, which of course looks beautiful. And you can see that th this goes right back all the way here and so what was once a beautiful fertile valley is is now just is, is like like you know valley of the dead and, and there is no plan b so now that they're having problems um with with honeybees uh, in the state and, and states and getting enough new colonies in to pollinate they haven't got the native bees are no longer there um you know there's no vegetation for goodness sake for anything to live so so we need to beware and 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 just just be sure that we don't follow the Americans with this. Um, pesticides, by pesticides I mean insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, molluscicides, the whole lot, but, but just the one that, that has been very topical for um, a couple of decades now actually, neonicotinoids. And neonicotinoids um, are, have been devastating. Um, that they're still, I mean they've been banned, they are at the moment still banned in the United Kingdom, thank goodness. But, but not so in the States. And the problem with neonicotinoids is not just what they do um, to the bees that visit the crops, but th this photograph illustrates that, so this, this is a, um, a cereal crop, and until recently, these were still allowed on cereal crops um, because they weren't visited by, flea, by, by bees. But 94% of this, this pesticide leaches into the ground and it's going into our waterways, um, and then, uh, horribly into the wildflower margins that the farmers are planting specifically um, for pollinators. Um, and they're, they're, they're neurotoxins, very, very toxic. So they're, they're wiping out aquatic invertebrates too. They're wiping out invertebrates um, on farmland, which is one of the many reasons that, that we are also, it's another contributing factor to farmland bird um, loss, not just the habitat, but, but the insects that they, they feed on are no longer there. So. It all sounds doom and gloom, but I, 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 I would not be doing what I do if I didn't have hope and if I didn't believe that, that together we can turn it around. I really do believe we can. Um, and, you know, but so the first thing is knowing what we're doing wrong or what is being done wrong. And then thinking, okay, what can I do myself? And, and we're all different. We all have different ways of doing things. Some of us um, can grow and, and create habitats at, at home. Others will write letters. Others will go and chain themselves, you know, to the railings outside um, Downing Street, different ways, but but I'm going to focus on what you can do um, at home, and and then you just need to know. So, what are bees' needs? What what do bees need? And I also think if you get it right for bees, you're getting it right for lots of other um, wild animals as well. So, so you know, I'm talking about bees, but it's everything really. So, habitat habitat for foraging um, to feed in, um, uh, habitat to um, to hibernate, so bumblebees like north-facing banks to hibernate on, for instance. Um, water, very important, and this is a good way to supply water um, to bees and other insects, to have, just get a little tray, fill it with stones and then water, and then they won't drown. Avoid blue, they're attracted to blue, you often have lots and lots of dead bees in paddling pools and things such like this, because they see in blue, they see um, in ultraviolet, so, so something like this for the water, and places some um, for them to, to nest as well. So you're thinking not just what to plant, but creating habitat for nesting for bumblebees and solitary bees. Um, and then i show you a few types of habitats that they like. Um, so top left is an abandoned rodent's nest. So it's a mouse hole. And that's kind of prime real estate for a bumblebee. Bumblebees love this because it's already been filled with nesting material, probably waterproofed. If it's been suitable for a rodent, it'll be great for a bumblebee. Um, so look out, when, when you see mouse holes, just, just uh, you know, or an abandoned one, stick a little stick there and watch out for bumblebees because they will come. Um, one or two of our very small solitary bees um, make their nests inside the, the sort of um, pithy stems of plants like bramble. Um, it, so w when you're clearing, when you start to think maybe about clearing in, in the... I don't know, it's a February, March time. Um, if you can, leave, leave everything in place. 
hopefully you already be leaving it in place because the seeds will be going to seed and it will have been feeding the birds over winter. But if you do need to clear because you have to get, you have to start planting. So when, you, when you're designing, um, you know, a, a, an area to grow, then take these dead stems and instead of burning them, which is what we often do, stack them, stack them against a wall somewhere and any hibernating or overwintering insects will have a chance to complete their life cycles um, and emerge as and when they're ready to do that. Um, and then rockeries. Um, rockeries are fantastic bumblebee nesting sites. And this is a mason bee. This is one of our um, mason bees. So, so the, the walls, red brick walls and cob walls and stone walls, you often get not colonies, but aggregations. You get lots and lots of bees. And you think there's a colony, but actually it's just a whole bunch of solitary bees. Um, all nesting there in, in the spaces between the cavities. And the building's been there for centuries. You know, it's not going to fall down because you have a few bees nesting inside the walls. And then, more out on a landscape scale, um, tussocky grass. Tussocky grass is just fantastic for our carder bumblebees, for a bunch of carder bumblebees. And, and they will nest where there have been voles. Kind of this kind of habitat will, will bring in voles, so of course then it'll bring in the barn owls and then it'll provide habitat for the, the rarer carder bumblebees. Um, and then sandy compacted soil. Sandy compacted soil is, so before you go covering everything with seed bombs, um, if, if check first, then this may be, this is ideal habitat for our ground nesting solitary bees. As is short grass, you know, lots of these bees like, to nest in short grass so so although we need of course to be growing wildflowers and allowing the grasses um, and the wildflowers to grow we also need to conserve certain habitats um, like this and this would be compacted sandy and sandy in a sunny position and you, you'd know you had these bees because you see um, tiny little holes and little mole hills mi miniature miniature mole hills and then you've got solitary bees nesting in your lawn or in your nice bare sandy patch of soil um, and sand you know we have a lot of um, uh, bees that nest uh, how they find their nests again I do not know but they do if you sit by a patch of sand and there are lots of solitary bees nesting there you see them flying in and they've got nothing to reorientate themselves but somehow you, you see them sort of doing all this figure of eight stuff and then they suddenly start burrowing and they're burrowing into exactly their nest um, with some pollen or maybe ready to lay another egg or something um, and rotten wood rotten wood as well as being great for many beetles and wood boring insects we do have two or three solitary bees in this country who love to bore into the rotten wood um, oh okay this is this is good so so now now is ivy bee time so out of our solitary bees the latest flying solitary bee in this country and it's only been around since the early 2000s, about 2002, I think they arrived. They, they just came across from northern France. Um, ivy bees. And ivy bees build their nests in, if you have a field, with, you know where the sheep leave those great big banks where the sheep are lent against them. You have a, a great big sandy bank. And if you come across a bank like that that's full of holes, now, just at the moment, you will probably, there'll be ivy bees there. If there are bees going in and out of the ground anywhere now, they're ivy bees, and I'll show you what one looks like. Um, there. So the ivy bee, the ivy, oh God, I mean, ivy is just incredible. Ivy, ivy, is, ivy is the plant that takes so many of these bees into the winter, um, bees and other pollinates. It, it's very easy to access for everything. And the difference, so that is an ivy bee, and it, people, people get quite confused between honeybees, ivy bees, and wasps. So the ivy bee has a really foxy-coloured thorax, and then she has these velvety stripes. Her abdomen is velvety orange and black striped. Absolutely tiny. A little bit smaller than a honeybee. But watch out on your ivy. And if you do see them, there's, um, there's a, a mapping, a recording um, program. Bees, wasps and ants recording society would love to hear about your sightings. Because they're looking to see how this bee is progressing north and, northwards. And they're doing very well. They're doing well in the United Kingdom, but they are not invasive species. They, they don't appear to be out-competing um, anything else at the moment. Lots of beekeepers don't like them on the ivy, but um, um, that's another story. Um, but hundreds of them, or thousands even, on our allotments. Uh, at the moment? Year, last year, 
last year, about this time or about maybe a week or two later. When the ivy starts flowering, because it's yeah. different everywhere. Yeah, just before the ivy came into flower, they, yeah. Were, yeah. they were hatching out. And then that's the other incredible thing about solitary bees. Solitary bees hatch out, you know, throughout the year you get different solitary bee species hatching out just when their flower mm. comes into flowers, so different bees for different sorts of flowers. Um, and I wanted to show you this bee as another favourite. This, so um, this, I can't remember its common name, Osmia spinulosa, the spined mason bee. So this is a relative of the red mason bee. This bee builds her nest in abandoned snail shells. Mm. And we have three snail shell bees in this country. She's one of them. And this is my absolute favourite. This is um, Osmia bicolor, the red-tailed mason bee. And I haven't got time to go into detail about the whole life cycle, but when she has finished laying her egg and filling the shell with little bits of gravel, she turns it upside down and then she covers it in little bits of pesto, sort of chewed up leaf. And then she goes and collects about 100 pieces of dried grass longer than herself, carries them back one by one, like a little witch on a broomstick, and she thatches her shell. Um, so she's often called the snail thatching bee. That's just one of our bees. Um, so, so yeah, leave your snail shells along edges. Put them along edges, because bees like to choose. They like to nest on edges. Um, the top left is, I've mentioned red mason bees, powerful mouth parts that they use. They're called mason bees because they build and they collect the mud with that and they seal their nests with mud, the red masons. Whereas the leaf cutters, um, top right, um, and that's not my photograph, that's, that, that's, so this, if you're lucky, you'll see leaf cutters carrying their leaves back or you'll have evidence of leaf cutters here. And this is what, what this is a bee hotel. So you can see the, um, the muddy um, tubes, they're all, they're all red mason nests and the ones that have got little bits of leaf stuck on the edge they are leaf cutters. Um, so, yeah, bee hotels fantastic. Don't bother with bumblebee nests because they're very expensive and they don't really attract the bumblebees. But bee hotels put in on a south or a southwest, southeast facing wall. It's quite complex because they're, they're better. Tubes are better than drilled holes. Again, I haven't got time to go into it, but the, the drilled holes, new evidence research is showing that they could actually be more like bee graveyards than bee hotels you know, because we can't clean them out, we can't prevent the parasites, we can't um, check to see that the, 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 the bees are healthy. But, so tubes, bamboo tubes, or um, counterintuitively, um, man-made cardboard tubes lined with paper are the safest um, for the red masons. Um, you can buy them online. Um, if you do want to bring bumblebees into your garden, try, try an upturned flower pot. Um, so, and then cover it with a slate so that the rain doesn't get in. And you see the hose pipe there on the bottom left, which is, that's like magnet to a bee. That's like, ooh, underground nest. And the hose pipe goes underneath and up inside the flower pot. And then at the bottom of the flower pot, you might get a piece of chicken wire of some sort and fill it with an old rodent's nest or some guinea pig bedding or something. Um, and the bees will be drawn to that because it will, it will look and smell like it's an abandoned rodent's nest. So, so that, that is a good way that you could, you could attract bumblebees. Um, and then I mentioned tree bumblebees a couple of times. Tree bumblebees are kind of the new bees on the block. So tree bumblebees also have arrived naturally um, from Northern Europe and they are doing incredibly well. Um, their, their niche is to nest in hollowed trees or bird boxes. And because we are a nation of bird lovers and, and most gardens have got bird boxes and once the blue tits and the great tits have moved out, then the following year, you're highly likely to get tree bumblebees um, setting up a colony. And, and th this is um, a tree bumblebee um, colony inside a bird box. But tree bumblebees are not fussy. They, they really are opportunist and they've been seen. So they, this is like one of those things you get at the bottom of flats. Um, they've been photographed in pillar boxes. And then in one of the gardens my husband used to work, um, so three years ago, there was a great tit nest, two years ago, tree bumblebees. And then in the farm opposite, this is my favourite. Um, so this is a, this, this farmer, this, this guy, David, would take out this and spread muck three times a week throughout the summer. Three times a week, he took the bumblebees with him. And <laughs> look, see, a little nest. So it was in that bit there. 
Um, and he got stung once or twice, but he let them be. He left them alone. Um, and, and he parked it as close as he could back in the right space when he got back. Um, so just going to really, really quickly now, I'm running out of time to wrap. I'm going to whiz through some flowers. You don't, I don't need to tell you which flowers um, to grow. You know, it depends where you live. Um, there are lists galore and there are books galore. But, but the thing you need to be doing is planting throughout the season. No longer just from um, March to October. We need, you know, bees are now confused and they are flying over winter. Um, so start, um, you know, early on with uh, hellebores bulbs. Plant the bulbs now. Bulbs are fantastic. And you can underplant the bulbs, whatever else you've got. Uh, on your patch, you know, bulbs will do well under planted. Um, Celandine, I've just put there because it's a, one of the wildflowers that's a magnet for short tongued bees. Dandelions, dandelions, dandelions. Um, red dead nettle. Um, so that's basically the ground cover, the sort of plant plants that pop up on, um, you know, amongst your vegetables. Um, uh, absolutely fantastic for bees as well as everything else that, that they do. Um, and lungwort, if you plant lungwort, you will get hairy footed flower bees. Um, I think if I had to choose four plants for a flower bed, so you're thinking, okay, I want something beautiful and I want to plant it specifically to attract and help bees. So Vipers bugloss, Vipers bugloss top left. Um, it, if it's flowering, it's producing nectar and pollen. That's not the case with all flowers, but Vipers bugloss open all hours. Um, wild marjoram has the highest sugar um, content in it of any nectar, about 80% sugars um, in its nectar, so it's fantastic, it's nutritious. Um, you know, it's like the difference between um, surviving on celery and avocados. Some, some, some flowers are more nutritious than others. Napita, all the cat mints, anything you can chop back um, so it's multitasking your space and it have a second flowering. And borage, you know, as well as all the other things, borage refills with nectar every two minutes. Um, so it's a super food. If you plant lamb's ear, stachys, you will get wool carder bees, and they are feisty little beasties. They're like gladiators, and I'm not going to tell you anything else about them, but they are amazing. Um, and then coming up to this time of year, already mentioned, so, so, and going broader with the other pollinators. So Michaelmas daisies just keep on flowering, and they, they, they just, they, you can hear them as you approach them with, with the pollinators. Um, and then the you know, the non-native, I know, but the um, uh, the verbena, bonaurensis, fantastic um, for many different pollinators. Um, and the, um, what's the, sedums. yeah, the sedums. Sedums, again, late flowering. They're great for carder bumblebees that are the last bumblebees to be flying in the year. And ivy, I've already mentioned, ivy is just um, a lifesaver. Going into winter... So now we need to be providing over winter. So the winter flowering heathers, the winter flowering honeysuckles, um, winter um, aconite, and mahonia. If you've got space for one more shrub on your plot, please make it mahonia because it flowers through the frosts and the snow, and it, it is it is another lifesaver for the winter flying bumblebees. And if you've got space for two shrubs, two mahonias. <laughs>
in that picture. Cut, if you cut the red clover after its flower, the second flowering, the short-tongued ones can get it. Yes, because it, it grows a lot, lot smaller. Yeah, so it, so all of these, so you do mow. You know, if, if you mow or scythe and, and chop, you will get second and third flowerings and you're also, you're multitasking for the ground nesting solitary bees. Um, this is our allotment, just, just to show that we, what we actually do is we fill every available space. Um, there are lots of vegetables there too, you can't really see them, but we just, we just fill every available space with flowering plants for bees um, and, and they seem to love it and our allotment does well. Um, going further afield, if you have any influence with councils, you know, please encourage them to allow vergers like this um, rather than the, the, the mode and dead verges we have. And, and so that's the wildflowers and the verges, but the hedgerows as well, you know, native hedgerows. So, so plants like hawthorn um, are just right up there again as solitary bee forage. Roundabouts, you know, this is what I call a roundabout. It's instead of lots of the ways that the roundabouts are, are covered now in petunias and um, bedding plants, you know, that, that really have no life in them whatsoever. Um, and I'm on borrowed time now, so I'm going to show you these these two books. If you're interested, um, the Field Guide to Bees. This will tell this this tells you everything you want to know about bees. It's a fantastic book, and this one, Plants for Bees, um, is the best Plants for Bees book out there. It, it's it's just streets ahead of all of the others. It's written by people who are plantsmen and who know their bees. And then one last one I'm going to show you is my book. <laughs> So that's my book that was published on Thursday um, and I was going to read you something from it but I haven't got time because um, I'm two minutes over, I've got a little clock on my thing. Um, but but the, the, this book is um, it's not a reference book, um, it's, it's a story book and it, it's taken me seven years to write and it's the story of, of how ten years ago I was walking across the Malvern Hills one day and I suddenly realised I knew more about the French Revolution than I did about our native trees. And, and it actually, it shocked me to the core. And, and so this, this is the story of my journey, but it includes everything I've told you about today and so, so much more about bees, but, but woven in um, so that it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's easy to read. And just when you think, oh gosh, lots of bees, then, there's, there's, then birds arrive um, or, or butterflies, or there's two chapters on the Outer Hebrides. Um, and it finishes on the Malvern Hills the whole of the last chapter is me walking across the Malvern Hills doing that same walk that I used to do to work 10 years ago and seeing what I noticed. And instead of it being two lines, it's a big long chapter of everything I notice. Um, and, and, and this is, and it's to do with reconnection. It's to do with all the things I've just talked about, but on top of all of that, noticing, taking time to notice again. So, so, you know, instead of just going out in your garden and planning um, and thinking, stop and sit and notice. And it's very interesting, I went into um, the, the area where they're selling books and um, I was looking at Luby's um, fantastic um, Mother Nature cards that she's, she's got a pack of Mother Nature cards and I went through them all and, and I picked out, you know, she, interesting to see which you pick out when you go through them and I picked out this one this is the one that I picked out that just resonated with me and when I turned it round it says um, get out get wild reconnect with nature it's time to let nature fully into your life nature is everywhere and it that kind of sums up my book um, which I'm not gonna have any time to read anything from sadly um, but I hope I hope I haven't overbeed you. you don't, none, of, none of the facts and figures, they don't matter, really. I, I just would love for you to, you know, next time you're out in your garden, stop and notice. And I am going to stop now because I'm three minutes over. And, and I have got, if anyone wanted to buy a book, um, that these are the permaculture, the shop here. Um, they have them, they have copies. Um, and I, I can sign it if, if, you'll, if you like sign published copies. Um, but anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if anyone wants to ask me any questions, I'm around. You know, I'll, I'll be.